God the Father, Christ Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, may these words be the words you would have for your people. May our hearts, minds, and souls be open to receiving, meditating, and believing your words to us about the saving grace of Christ Jesus. May the proud be humbled and the humble lifted up. And all the honor and glory are yours. And we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. So if you would, please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Verses 1 through 12. And this is a double bonus because we just read this a few weeks ago in the gospel reading on Sunday. So... As we mentioned there, um, it was the Beatitudes and blessings. But tonight I want to, we'll read through this and then I'll go into each of them. Because I really, there's a deeper message in this that I think is important for all of us to know. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. And that's where I'm going to stop right there. clickers. So a little bit of background on the situation at the time when Jesus was doing this Sermon on the Mount. He had gathered his, on the side of a hill, gathered his disciples. And it's important to realize that it's not just the 12 future apostles, but it's all the followers and people who believed in Christ as the Messiah. So it could have been hundreds of people. We, it's, it's not written, but it's more than just the 12. And the purpose that Jesus uh, brought this message out was he was teaching his disciples or challenging them about what it looks like to live as a follower of his, as a Christian. His message, be motivated by your heart rather than the law of Moses. He was teaching what the character traits look like for followers. And that's what the focus is going to be, is there's character traits in each one of these blessings that we should follow. He wants us to have a heartfelt relationship of love with him versus a legalistic relationship. So at the time of Jesus, the religious leaders, whether it be the scribes, Pharisees, the rabbis, they prided themselves on their outward appearance and how they followed the law of Moses. They were on time. They did the sacrifices. You know, on Sabbath, you couldn't do this or that. Every law, they, everything was external about following the law. The spiritual leaders had turned what was supposed to be a loving relationship with God into a law-filled relationship. And so what that produces is self-righteousness, or as I like to call it, the unholy trinity, the me, myself, and I. So lawlessness, self-righteousness. 
So Jesus comes along with a completely different way of teaching. And he's saying, if you know me and have a relationship with me, you will be more motivated to obey me and what I say because you have a love relationship with me. So it becomes a love or a heart relationship. It becomes heart obedience instead of a legalistic or a law type obedience. And it's so more important that we have that love relationship versus a legalistic relationship. And I'm, I'm going to try to explain to you the difference between the two because sometimes they're kind of nuanced, what it means. I'll give you an example. If you're driving your car down the road and there's a cop behind you, what are you going to do about your speed when you're driving? Are you going to follow the speed limit? Why is that? It's because the law is making you do it. That's why you did it. Now think, what if you had a car full of kids and you were driving down a road? Would you drive crazy and fast because it didn't matter? No cops, you would just drive crazy? Well, maybe people, some, some people do. But no, you would drive safely because of your love for your kids. That's a love relationship versus a legal relationship or a law. You're following the law because the cop's there, and that's the law, versus love because you have love for who is with you. That's the difference between a legalistic relationship and a love relationship. Jesus is explaining and teaching that his followers must be motivated by love and not the law. In today's society... Christian, non-Christians is what, uh, non-Christians, and there's different ways. Uh, Pastor calls it the post-Christian era. Uh, in some of the textbooks that I read for school, we call them non-Christians. The society as a whole, they look at the Beatitudes or those blessings, and they look at them as great principles to live your life, because they really are. Be meek and all that. But that's how they look at them culturally. Those are just good ways to live your life. But followers of Jesus and Christians today, these blessings are meant to be received as a way of life as a devoted follower of Christ. At the time when Jesus presented the Beatitudes, this was a new revolutionary way for the culture. It was uncomfortable for people to hear about love and follow what follow your parents because you love them versus they are your parents and they set the, the law down on you. One thing that I find interesting, and this some of you may have heard this, is that in the Old Testament are the Ten Commandments, right? Those are ten things that we're supposed to not do. The Beatitudes or the blessings can be looked at as eight things that we should do. So, Ten Commandments don't do those. The Beatitudes do them. These blessings are presented as eight character traits. And I'll go through each of them just to show you what they mean. They are not multiple choice. You don't pick and choose which ones you should follow. You should do all of them. And as I review them, they do progress I would say not in strength, but the persecution of a Christian gets stronger as you go through them. The way you live your life gets harder as you go through them. Each one of them are, are characteristic, characteristics of Christians or followers of Jesus that opens the door to your inner happiness and relationship with Christ. They are a blessing. But there's something else that comes with each one of these, and I'm also going to highlight that. Each one of these bless blessings comes with a promise. And I'm going to hit on those as well. Sometimes I think we, we skip over that part of it. So the first blessing, or the character trait, and that's what I'm going to refer to them, is the poor in spirit. So being poor in spirit 
is anybody who has spiritual poverty. This isn't physical. Who's de- people who are destitute, they have a destitute or a spiritual desolation or condition because of their sinful nature. Because they become poor in spirit. Happiness begins when we see our own spiritual emptiness and turn toward Christ. How poor we are in spirit turns to joy when we turn toward Christ. When we surrender our hearts to Jesus as our King, then we receive the promise. But before I get to the promise, let me read you some scripture. I've got scripture for each one of these. So in Luke 17, uh, it says, Being asked by the Pharisees, When the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. When you have Christ in you, you have the kingdom of God with you. It's not there it is, and so forth. So, once you receive the blessing... And that character trait, you get a promise. And that promise is you get the kingdom of heaven. And there's two words that are used in the Bible a lot. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of God is in us. God is with us. Kingdom of heaven is where we go when our bodily, when our body dies, goes in the ground, our spirit goes to heaven. So the second blessing is for those who mourn. This blessing is given to those who are grieving. It can be grieving personal relationships or a loss of a loved one or other reasons. But understand that also, this also helps us build our character. Saifu, you hit on this perfectly on Sunday. It molds us when we suffer and we mourn, and we have trials and tribulations in our life. Sometimes that forges, forges us or shapes us into the spiritual being God wants us to be. Second Corinthians is a, is a uh, scripture verse or verses on mourn, mourning. Blessed be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us all in our affliction. And I know, Saifu, you brought this one up the other day, and it's interesting that we both picked the same one. So that you may be able to comfort those who are in affliction with the comfort for which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. So what this is saying to us is, when you're afflicted and are comforted, you need to comfort people who else are being afflicted. Remember the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and also love your neighbor. When people are in distress and mourning, comfort them. So what is the promise that if we mourn, we will be comforted? Turn your suffering, and I hate to keep referring back to Saifu, but he hit on every one of these on Sunday. He turned to Jesus and became stronger in his faith when he needed it. The next blessing is blessed are the meek. And the character trait, a character trait is meekness. And this is not thinking about being scared of you know, animals or insects or things like that. It is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking less about yourself. That's really the key of this. Think less about yourself. Put others ahead of yourself. In Philippians, 
Chapter 2, it says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. You will have more blessings in this life when you put others first. Now, what is the promise for this character trait of being meek? The, the promise is you will inherit the earth when the heavens and the the sky rolls back as a scroll, the moon, the blood, the sun goes dark, and we can't have a new heaven and earth, you're gone. You will inherit the earth. How beautiful is that? So the next character trait is those who hunger for thirst and righteousness. No matter how hard we try, no matter how much we pray, we still fall short of the glory of God because we're sinners, because of our sinful nature. We're, we will never become perfectly righteous. Being righteous means following every law of Moses perfectly, and none of us can do that. The law was given to show our inability to live up to a righteous standard of God. Say that again, the law was given to show us our inability to stand up to the righteousness or the, the righteous nature of God. He is perfect and righteous. So we needed a Savior to be able to atone for our unrighteousness. No matter how hard we try, we can't get there. If we have faith in Jesus Christ because of what he did in life, in the perfect life, and on the cross, he paid for our unrighteousness by living that perfect life and dying and taking our sins upon him. He exchanged or gifted that to each of us who believes in him. It is a free gift for those who believe. And in 2 Corinthians, here I am hitting Saifu all over again. For our sake, he made him to be sin. Who knew no sin, so that in him we might become righteousness, righteous of God. So if we live a life that is unrighteous and we believe in Christ and we become righteous because of what he did and nothing that we did to gain that, then we have the glory. So what is the promise that we get for when we hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus will fill us up. So when you're in that sinful nature, trying your best, the best line I ever heard, and I got to tell you is, you know, I, one time I didn't sin for seven hours, but then I woke up. <laughs> So the next character trait is uh, being merciful. Mercy is, is not getting what you deserve. So we all deserve justice for our sinfulness because we deserve that, the justice of God. We deserve that. But mercy is given to us. So because we get mercy, what is this character trait telling us to do? Give mercy to others, always. In Luke 6, very, very, very succinct, be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. So, the character trait is to be merciful. What is our promise or our gift that we get? The promise is God promises mercy for us. The next character trait, our blessed or those that are pure in heart. During the time of Jesus, the Pharisees always worried about their external appearance. The ephod, the, how they looked, their headdress, everything, how they did their ceremony. Everything was ceremonial, the outward appearance, their uniforms. However, God is always concerned about your inward appearance, what's in your heart. The old most... Moses, or law of Moses, 
practice of cleansing the body, the hands and the feet and the food, and those were all practiced by the people of those days. That was external cleansing. God wants us to have a clean heart, a loving heart. And that's best captured in 1 John chapter 3. Behold, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him who was perfect, because we shall see him as he is. Amen. And so for that character trait of being pure in heart, what is the promise that we get? You get to see God. That's a great character trait to have, to be able to see God. So next is one that we talked about with Angus. Thanks for bringing that one up there. The peacemakers. This isn't about people who stop fights, although that's good, people stopping physical Fights like what was happening at the petting zoo, physical fights over food. It's someone who would never compromise the truth of the word, the truth about Jesus Christ. That is a peacemaker. Truth is the word of God in your relationship with Christ. Would you compromise that relationship? So in 1 Thessalonians, it's kind of a long uh, section in, in chapter 5. Let me just read through that. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not dis despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. So the character trait of peacemakers, what, do, what is their promise? They will be sons of God. So the promise... Is, and that means that you will have a relationship with God and God will make peace with man through the cross with you because you believe in Christ. He reconciled man, man to himself because of Christ through the cross. We exemplify this when we are peacemakers ourselves and never compromise our faith or the word that's in our scripture in the Bible. And our relationship. Never compromise your relationship with Christ. And the last character trait that I'm going to speak about is, that this is a, a, a trait, but it's those that are persecuted for righteousness sake. You know, we don't see physical persecutions per se here in the United States. But you may remember one of the sermons Pastor put up the number. There's over 5,000 Christians who die every year. That's significant. There are Christians who are persecuted physically. But we are persecuted by being harassed socially, mocked in public for being Christians. That is persecution, although not physical. We see an ever-increasing amount of social harassment and resentment for being Christians. But we still are blessed for being here in the United States because we're not one of the over 5,000 that are being murdered around the world for being a Christian. So 2 Corinthians says, So we do not lose heart, Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us uh, for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And so, the character trait or the blessing is for those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And the, the promise that's given to them is kingdom of heaven. For all who are persecuted for believing in Jesus, the promise is the kingdom of heaven. 
The message of these blessings is that we need to have a heartfelt relationship with Jesus. He paid for our sins to make us righteous in, in God's eyes. Through the, lens, through the lens of Jesus, God sees us as clean and righteous. Trust in him, in him and in his word. Beloved, we are, we are called as Christians to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and strength. Jesus spoke to the disciples about what it looks like to be a follower of his. So let us as God's people follow those teachings and those character traits of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let us pray. Thank you, God, for redeeming us through your son, Jesus Christ. Let us as God's people Follow his teachings. Let us forgive others without pause. Thank you for viewing us through the lens of Jesus, who was perfect and obedient. All glory and honor are yours, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.